I mean, we'll get out something to take notes with, take some pictures with. Um, I'm sure every one of you are, are super, super intrigued watching online. We're trying to make this thing go viral. We're going to catch Pastor Josh. He's talking about gender wars in, in church. And uh, today we're going to specifically, as far as gender wars and everything that's going on, again, we're going to talk about a lot of different subjects over the next week. Uh, but today specifically, we're going to start with biological sex and gender. Anybody want to trade places? <laughs> biological sex. <laughs> Biological sex and gender. And the reason why we're going to start here, uh, by the way, is not because this is where I want to start. I, we're starting here because this is where God started at the very beginning. Uh, and we have to, again, address this because this idea of our sexuality and our gender and our identity is under complete attack. And we're seeing all sorts of different messages everywhere we look. It's on Facebook, it's on social media, it's on job applications, uh, it's on our websites, it's in our, new, it's in our workplace, it's all over the news, it's in our entertainment. You cannot watch a show on Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or any of the other platforms ever without some form of communication that's reinforcing or introducing new topics or ideas. It's found its way into our legislature, it's found our way into the educational system, and so now here we are as followers of Jesus or wanting to be followers of Jesus or claiming to be followers of Jesus, we find ourselves in a situation. We find ourselves in this place of, I don't know really what to do here. And so this is why we have to talk about it because I believe there's a lot of people, there's Christians in the room and you feel torn. You, you don't know how to respond. Am I supposed to take a stance here? Am I supposed to be, be more vocal? Should I get on Facebook and you know, what, what do I do? How do I, how do I take a stand? Or how do I, I I'm, I'm just torn because if I take too much of a stand, then I'm going to get labeled. And then I think there's another large portion of our church family uh, that maybe you're struggling in your sexuality. Maybe you're struggling in your gender identity. And we, we, by the way, we acknowledge all of these things here. We're not we're not, our heads aren't in the sand. These are real, real issues. You're struggling with gender. You're struggling with your sexual identity because, listen, things that you've experienced, things that you've seen, choices maybe you've made or choices that have been made for you and have left you in this complexity of figuring out how do I navigate my sexuality and my sexual experience based on what I've experienced growing up and the environment that I was raised in and Again, I think there's also a large group of people, and this is the reason why we have to talk about it, because this topic literally touches everybody. If I could poll everybody and say, how many of you know somebody that's struggling with? How many of you are dealing with? Yeah. Hands would be all over the place. Yeah. A lot of us, I think, are struggling because we're, we're in the struggle with somebody that we love that's struggling with it. Yeah. Uh, 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 this identity and our sexuality, and this is not a single out any type, any form of any type of gender or sexuality at all. Um, and I just need to give you this disclaimer because it's important for you to know that I'm not speaking on this as a scientist. I am not a counselor. I am not a biologist. Um, I'm not a social media influencer. Um... I'm not approaching this subject as a Democrat or a Republican. I'm approaching this subject, like we do all subjects, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which means I am free from the obligation to appease or win a popularity contest. But because I love you, every single one of you, and we all have struggles and we all have issues, we are going to go, like we do all the time, when, whenever there's a culturally hot topic, we don't look to the world, we look to the Word. And the reason why we have to look to the Word is because the Bible says, and by the way, this is easy to say, but it's hard to do. The Bible says that you have to rightly divide the Word of truth. So many Christians, followers of Jesus, taking God's word and incorrectly dividing the word of truth. Did you know that you could take this word and make it say anything that you want it to say? You could 
pick and choose and nitpick God's word to bash a certain group, alienate certain people, judge other people, while you yourself are living the same exact ways in different areas that the Bible condemns. So we have to go to God's word, but we have to go to God's word rightly, understanding and allow God's word uh, to, to speak to us. This is not a cultural thing. This is a kingdom thing. Um, and so we're, we, have to, we have to do this. And again, there's going to be some things that I will say, especially watching online or in the room, there's going to be some things that I say that you might not agree with. And guess what? This is the only, by the way, environment that I know of that's going to tell you this because this is so anti our culture. That's okay. Or did you hear? Because you don't hear that in your workplace. I'm going to say some things, and if you don't agree, it's okay. You still can come back. We've always dreamed about creating a family environment where it's okay to belong before you believe. That we're not here trying to manipulate you, twist your arm, beat you until you turn or burn. We're saying, hey, all. What did I say? Turn or burn? You could tell how I was raised. I grew up old school. <laughs> See that? I didn't even know I said that. It just came out. Look, this is because, and you, again, we have to acknowledge, I'm a pastor's kid, five generations on each side. I grew up with a lot of the finger pointing. I grew up on the one side with a lot of judging certain sins worse than other sins. A lot of influence and highlighting of certain issues while minimalizing and disregarding our own issues. Because those weren't culturally big or culturally provocative. And uh, again, the same word that we look at that we use to judge others and correct others also says, are you ready for this? All have sinned and all have fallen short. Every single person in this room. So you have to hear the heart coming from this and hear the heart of the Father. All have sinned. All have fallen short. This is not the bad people versus the good people. The reality of the gospel is it's all bad people in need of a good Savior that saved us and redeems us. And listen, meet you just where you are. Meets us just where we are. Uh, so again, you would just have to understand this. I get, I'm making a lot of disclaimers because it doesn't matter. I already know whatever I say, people are going to judge, and I'm okay with that. Um, and, I, and I understand that people are hurt, people are broken. People, the church has got this wrong on so many occasions uh, for so long. Uh, but you need to, someone that loves you to tell you, listen, we're all guilty. We're just guilty in different ways. And the same grace that I needed is the same grace that you need and the same blood that was shed for me was also shed for you. And it can save everyone. So listen, I'm, just, I'm talking this, and you can tell this front part is especially for the religious. Jesus' harshest words in scripture were for the religious. People that thought they had it together because they had the big ones. They weren't, oh, no, 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 no. He's came, coming from, so... Why am I saying this? Because we don't go to God's word to use it as binoculars to judge how everyone else is living their life, yeah. to view everyone else's sin. You go to God's word to use it as a mirror to reflect your own sin in your own life that God's addressing and telling you that you need to correct and to fix. Uh, so we're not going to beat, if it, we're not beating anybody up. My hope is to build us all up. All, every single one of us has has a need. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Romans chapter 1. And I'm going to do something that I don't normally do when talking on a subject like this. Is I'm just going to read a lengthy piece of scripture. And the reason why I'm going to read a, a significant uh, piece of scripture is because not only is this Paul's epistle to the Christians that were in Rome that are living in complete chaos. I mean, Rome is crazy it's heavy heavily influenced by greek philosophy and uh, there's there's pedophilia there's i mean every type of sexual sin heter heterosexual same sex, it, everything is perverse everything is over the top in excess in rome and the christians are in the middle of it people that were following jesus are in the middle of it and they're wondering the same thing as we are what do we do 
What is going on? Um, and so Paul addresses this because I believe this is not just written, written and prophetic about the Roman Empire. It's true about any empire that walks away from God's command and God's decrees. So it's a prophetic text that I believe, even though it was written almost 2,000 years ago, listen at the eerily similar situations that we find ourselves in today. And Paul's going to start off very sweet and very slow and very loving by talking about the wrath of God uh, in verse 18. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he says this way, and I'm going to try just to read it, but there, there's going to be some times where I can't help myself. I'm going to have to talk about some things. But he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what, what type of ungodliness? Come on, say that like you believe. Like what type? All. Notice we're reinforcing all of sin. All ungodliness, all unrighteousness. Is that singling out any sin? You see how inclusive God's word is when it comes to sin? People are like, oh, he's so exclusive. They always put, no, 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 no. It's very, very inclusive. He's going to get to a list at the end of this chapter. You'll see we're all on it. God, God, you know, God wants us all to feel like we can participate in this scripture. <laughs> all, all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. Let me say one more thing, because it's very unpopular, again, in church today to, to hear this word wrath, especially as you're talking about God. We don't like to hear or talk about the wrath of God, because that makes God sound vengeful. That makes God sound angry. Let me tell you something. Wrath is what you have when you love something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You have to understand this. God is not wrath. God pours out wrath because he has such great love. Wrath is the response when you love something, when you need to pour out wrath to protect the thing that you love from something that's trying to destroy it. So God doesn't pour out wrath on people. God pours out wrath on sin because God hates sin because sin has the ability to destroy your life. So that's why God has to have wrath. If you love something, you have wrath. I love my kids. If a sexual predator comes on my property, they're going to feel the full weighted wrath of Josh Whitlow. That doesn't mean that I do not love. It means I have wrath because I love. So don't make God to be the big mean guy that's just looking to drop the piano on our heads. No, he has wrath because he has love. Yeah, so and he tries to keep his children from experiencing the destructive force of sin, which is why his wrath must be poor. The wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, come on, every person say it together. What do they do? They... They suppress the truth. Never seen this more prevalent than where we are right now. And I'm not talking about from culture. I'm talking about in churches. Yeah. Suppress the truth. Hey, hey, don't talk about that. Or let's take the truth and let's just make it a little bit more easy to. It's not that we don't know what right and wrong is. It's just that we don't like right and wrong. It's not that God hasn't spoken. We just don't like what he said. So when that becomes the reality, what do you begin to do? Suppress the truth. Squeeze the truth. Manipulate the truth. By the way, Satan, our adversary, has been doing this from the beginning in the garden. Did God really say that? What is that? Distort. Suppress. Tweak. The truth. Let's go on. For although they knew God... They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became, I'm an expert. I got the degrees on the wall. I went to this college. My, my university professor said this. You know, uh, my, my book, my textbook said this. My English teacher said this. My biology teacher said this. My friends say this. We're all, we're, we've got all the information in the world, no wisdom. All the knowledge in the world, zero wisdom. They claiming to be wise, they became fools. Here's a word that you're going to hear over and over again. And they what? They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling 
mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And before you sit here and say again, well, Josh, God's word is so irrelevant. It's so dumb. We don't do that anymore. 1.12, 112, sorry, 112 million of us screamed and painted for a ram and a bingo. For some of you who are completely lost, I'm talking about the Super Bowl. <laughs> some of you are like, a ram and a bingo, what? <laughs> the zoo? <laughs> Birds and animals and creeping things. So therefore, God, this is, this, is, this is hard, gave them up. Not that God stopped loving them, but God didn't create robots. God's not going to force you to live a certain way. This is the concept of free will. God loves you, but he's not going to force you. And when you persistently choose over and over again that this is my life, my way, my feelings, my thoughts, okay. God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Here's why. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. It's happening all over us in every single topic and every single area today. The exchanging of the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Or they worshiped and served what was created Verse worshiping and serving the creator who is blessed forever and ever and amen. Listen, every single time we find ourselves worshiping what was created versus the creator, guess what that is? That means we are worshiping ourselves. We become God when we worship the created versus the creator. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. He goes on. For this reason again, what happened? God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, this, isn't this happening everywhere? Don't even see fit to acknowledge God. Why would you acknowledge God when you're God? God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And they were, here it is, the same type of, they were filled with what type of manner? All. Say it again. All. All. Again, we don't make this the it issue. Everyone is, inclu it's very inclusive. All manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boast. Does the Bible sound a bit judgy to you right now? Just, it's on a roll. Part a little a bit judgy today. Boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they knew God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. If it feels good, do it. We'll post it, tweet it, celebrate it. Comment on it. You know what that prophetic text, not only do I feel like it also resembles exactly where we are today as a culture, do you know what also it's a result of? A fallen, sinful world. Full of broken people. Here's what I know about what we just read. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it can be challenging. What I also know is that every single person in the room is somewhere on that list. 
See, I know it's quick. It's very easy for the religious and for Christians in general to look at just one issue or one topic. Let me tell you something. Every single person has been, is currently, or will be somewhere on the list. It affects every single one of us. Every single one of us qualify for the all matters of unrighteousness. Because the Bible says, there is none that is righteous, no, not one. So we all are under this umbrella, and as we begin to talk about this idea of sexuality and gender and all matters of unrighteousness, the real question that you need to answer, that we need to answer, that I need to answer, the real issue is all about sovereignty. Who is sovereign in your life? When I, am, when I ask that question, what I really mean is, who gets to decide what's right and wrong to you? Is there any absolute authority or absolute truth, or is everything just relative? Does someone actually get to call the shots in your life with your gender, with your sexuality, with your calling, with the decision making? Is there someone that is sovereign in your life? Because I'm telling you, when, it, when truth is relative and it, your truth is just your truth and my truth will be my truth and you do what feels good to you and, and that'll be your truth, when you do that, listen, you're making yourself God. And then this text becomes prophetic and self-fulfilling because it says the created, they worship what was created versus, versus the creator. And listen, when you're God, when I'm God, especially in the area of sexuality and gender, you begin to exchange the truth about God for a lie. So very quickly, I'm going to give you three lies that culture is telling us, the world is telling us, and I'm going to give you three truths from God's word about those things. Why? Because we cannot exchange the truth about God for a lie. So I want you to write these down. Don't throw anything at me. Don't, some of your faces already, goodness gracious, I wish you could switch places with me right now. <laughs> You're going to be okay. And by the way, let me just say this. As we go through these lies, don't allow yourself to look through these lies through the context of one sin or one issue. Do you know what that means? That means find your place on the list, wherever you're living in the list, and apply these lies there because they exist there too. It's not a specific one. No, 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 no. Again, very, very inclusive. Not just for one group of people. But it is important. So look through this as, as we walk through this, with this, through this lens. My list. God, what are you speaking to me? Here's lie number one that culture is telling, that I think we've exchanged for, is that we say this, lie number one is that God made me this way. God made me this way. God wants me, Josh, at the end. God is love. God wants me, obviously, to be me. I feel like this, therefore, this must be okay. This is just, what? Who I am. You can apply this in every single area. My dad was an alcoholic. My grandfather was an alcoholic. My mom is an alcoholic. I guess I am just going to be a alcoholic. They were angry. I've struggled with anger my whole entire life. I guess this is just who God, God must want me to be angry. As if acknowledging the struggle is the same thing and equal to God's will for your life. Like there was no fall, there was a fallen state that creates complications and all of this stuff. God just wants me to be this way. And because I am this way, it must be okay. It must be God's call. It must be God's design for my life. So what I want to do very quickly, because we are talking specifically about sexuality and gender today, I want to look at how God made us from the beginning, not how we are now. This is important. Not how we are now, not how we feel like we are, or how we want to be. I want to look at the original intent of the creator, who we were created to be from the beginning. Are you okay? Just slightly, just, I don't need a big smile, just a little smile. Let's see if we can find the original intent of not the created, 
of the Creator from the beginning. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going to read a couple verses in Genesis chapter 2. It says, so God created man, this is the very beginning, in his own image. By the way, all mankind created in the image of God. Not in your image, not in my image, in his image. Which means all of us have equal value. Oh, this is so good. Because some of you are already trying to cancel me. Everybody has equal value. Regardless of where you are on the list, everyone has equal value because everyone was created in the image of God. This is Genesis. We're before the fall, so here we go. In his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Let's go to chapter 2 and see how he created them. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Then the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. By the way, this is the only time that God looked at his creations. The only time he said something wasn't good was when man was alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with the flesh. And the rib the Lord God had taken from the man, what did he do? He he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. I've got to read that because some of y'all thought Adam made Eve. It's craziness. And here you see at the very beginning, not just the creation of male and female, you see the creation and the original intent of the family framework. That it was not up to us to decide the family construct of, ready? Male, female, husband, wife, mother, father. And I love the fact that God formed Adam, the, the creator of the universe, everything else, by the way, he spoke into existence. He just said, let there be, and it came. But when it came to mankind, because he wanted to create us in his image, God got down on the earth and he, and he grabbed us and he formed Adam. And he would have he given Adam some muscular uh, texture to him. He, gave, he created and formed Adam's male anatomy, specific male anatomy. He would have created Adam and given Adam an X and a Y chromosome. If you would take a doctor from today or a biologist today and we could transport back in time to when Adam was formed, that doctor would 100% say Adam is guaranteed 100% biologically male. The same way Eve wasn't an afterthought, that God was actively involved in forming Eve. And he, he formed Eve and would have given Eve an X and an X chromosome and gave and designed Eve with reproductive organ, organs. And Eve was created 100%, listen, biologically female. Now, we used to understand this. It wasn't until the 19, early 70s where we kind of separated biological sex with gender. They used to be interchangeable in the same thing. They're not today, and that's okay. But we used to understand biological sexes, male, female. We understood when you were in the hospital and you had a boy. I didn't need a doctor to tell me I had just had Josh. I didn't need a third party to come in and be like, I think it's a boy. I knew right away. And, uh, and when he was, uh, you know, when it was time to take him home, they gave Josh a, now this is, this is not meant to, this is just reality. They gave Josh a blue, blue blanket. He got wrapped in blue, got a little blue beanie. That, that, that was too significant, significant because that was supposed to signify his, not only his gender, biological sex, but also his gender of masculinity. He's going to be a boy. And same thing when we had Lucy. No one had to tell me I had a girl. I could look at her and know that it was a biological, she was a biological female. When we went home with Lucy, they put her in pink. Um, but two biological sexes. God's word, listen, and biology are in complete harmony and unison on this subject. 
of two created by bio- Now, I know I've, you think, you're looking at me like I've just said something super controversial. I haven't yet. <laughs> We're going there. Again, why are we talking? It's important. These, the idea of the biological sexes. Listen, though, but gender, which we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks, gender, how that biological sex is worked out and experienced in a fallen world is very, very complicated. Your biological sex, is just, and by the way, for all the people, then this is true. And again, this, the enemy's using this. Because it is true in this fallen world, because of the fall, after Genesis 3, when sin entered the world and Satan has been wreaking havoc on God's design ever since he created something perfect in the beginning. Why? Because whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. And he tries to twist it and he manipulates it. And he's been tearing at the fabric of what God did in the very beginning ever since. And this is why there is, and it's true, there's genetic uh, research about these indicators that people could be predisposed or born certain ways. There's about 0.1 or 0.2% of cases that are true where biological sexes are born with ambiguous genitalia and all of these things. And people are wanting to point to that and cling to that. And I'm just saying that's true. But that's a result of our fallen genetic nature, not how God created us to be. So we don't stick our heads in the sand, though, and just say, man, you're masculine, you're feminine. No, because we live in a fallen world. Listen, it is very, very real. It is very, very true that these problems exist and they can be complex in a fallen world. As a result, listen, of not God's design, but because of your enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy your family and your ability to reproduce and raise godly kids. We have to understand this because if we use the whole God made me this way, what what we're really doing, and by the way, in your area, wherever you're on the list, God made me an alcoholic. God made me a cheater. God made me a drunk. God made me addicted. God did it. If you do that, listen, it's easier to blame God than to change yourself. It's easier to say, God did this, so if God did it, I might as well, I'm I'm just stuck with it. He made me this way. And what you unintentionally do when you blame God is you conclude that the God, the creator, actually made a mistake when he made you. So because God made a mistake, here's what we do. We now begin a journey to recreate and rediscover my gender and sexuality. Because God made a mistake. And what's happening, again, we already read it. The created trying to become the the creator. And because the creator made a mistake, here's my sole chief ambition. I'm going to help God fix what he did wrong. Can I tell you, I don't know if any, anyone's loved you enough to tell you. That's the opposite of the gospel. The gospel is not us helping fix what God did wrong. The gospel is a perfect God helping change what we did wrong. How bad we've fallen, where we've messed up since the fall. Not us helping God. And again, all of this feeling, but God, me, my emotions, this is how I feel, therefore that I am. Can I tell you something? The gospel is not about self-fulfillment. The gospel is about self-denial. Even if you do, even even when we are born inclined to sin, which we all are, even if we are born predisposed to lean a certain way or to act a certain way or to behave a certain way because of the fall, because of our upbringing, because of our environment, because of what we've experienced, what we've done or what's been done to us, You have to understand it can be, it can be hard, but that's why the message of the gospel is never about please self, it's crucify self. Wherever you are on the list, because we all have desires. We all have issues. God's word is calling us to address and die. And listen, this is why we don't start with culture. We start with creation. And the reason we start with creation is because Genesis 1 through 3 gives us a picture of what it was supposed to be. If you don't, if you disregard, if you take away Genesis 1 through 3, then we have zero clue how we were meant to be. 
before the fall. So you have to start at the beginning, original intent in every single one of these areas. The truth, again, the lies, God made you this way. And God, can I just tell you something? God didn't make you your way. Here's the truth. Write it down like this. God made you his way. God made you his way. His way is perfect. It always has been perfect. The fall and whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. Tries to manipulate and distort. Y'all okay? Let me give you these two very quick and we're going to go. Line number one, again, God made me this way. Line number two, the Bible is old and times have changed. The Bible is old and times have changed. Can I just, just a few points here. I can't spend a lot of time. When is truth bound by time? Like, when does truth stop being truth? Because a new culture came along? Because a law was passed? Because I have a new opinion? I've been enlightened? I'm, I'm, so, I'm so interested in that process. About how you got enlightened? And Can I tell you something? The reason... That, I'm just talking about God and his word. The reason why you can know that God is still relevant and so is God's word still relevant. Did you know that thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, all over the Old Testament, by the way, and the New Testament, it always forbidden sexual sin and sexual immorality. And by the way, all sexual sin, all sexual immorality. So before you judge everyone because you're like, you're this, Jesus says, hey, not so fast because you don't commit adultery with your hands, you commit it with your heart. And on every list of the sexual and moral is also the adulterer, the fornicator. So we're all on this list together. We can't ail it. It's inclusive. Come on, we're all to get it together again. But the reason it's so relevant, you can tell, is that it's always forbids sexual sin all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament. Have you ever thought to consider that the reason it forbidden it back then is because they were doing the exact same things we are today? Walking through the same things, the same issues. We just read about it. So yes, I can't, I can't get into this whole entire situation. I do believe times have changed. I believe that God made everything perfect and we've been going downhill ever since. I don't believe God made a bunch of mistakes and we're trying to fix his problems. He is the universal law giver and has given us his universal law. The Bible is old and times have changed. The truth is, God is unchanging and so is his word. Yeah. Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is not, I know some of you just are so archaic to some, this is not an old book. This is an internal book. Yeah. It guides, it speaks, it illuminates, it corrects. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, God's word is, say it with me, God's word is what? Can you believe it? It'll work if you let it. <laughs> Y'all know. It'll work if you let it. That means don't tweak it. Don't put your feelings on it. Don't put your filter into it. Well, I just need to find me a verse that'll support how I live. You can find them. But that's not going to work. It's... It's alive and it's working. It's sharper than the double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us. Surgery, it's helping make us better where the soul and the spirit are joined to the center of our joints and bones. And it judges, I love this, it judges the what? The thoughts and the feelings in our hearts. Let me tell you something. This new generation, young people, you better fall in love with God's word because culture is screaming. If you feel it, do it. If you're thinking it, it's okay. And God's word comes along and says, no, 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 not so fast. I've got something better for your life if you will trust me and submit to God's way and God's word. We don't follow our feelings, we follow the word of God. We don't follow the way that we think, we go to God's word so it'll change the way that we think. And culture, listen, is desperate for an ounce of authenticity. Desperate for a young Daniel, a young man, a young woman of God that will stand up and say, not how I'm going to live. 
going with ever-changing, ever-active, ever-working Word of God. The Bible's old and times have changed. No, God is loving. God is unchanging, and so is His Word. Let me give you lie number three. We're going to wrap up. Lie number three that we tell ourselves we've heard is, if God is loving, He also must be tolerant. If God is loving, he also must be tolerant. This is crazy to me. Um, and it, and it, it is a, a tricky, and it's, it, can be, it can be used, by the way, so manipulatively. Um, but I'm telling you what, especially young, I don't know, I'm so glad I'm not a young person in this culture generation anymore. Y'all are crazy. <laughs> crazy. Parents are crazy. We, culture has forced us to believe that love and tolerance are the same thing. That if you love me, listen to me, you'll tolerate me. If you love me, you'll accept my choices. If you love me, you'll celebrate me. If you love, and if you don't, ooh, in the name of tolerance, we'll cut you off. If you don't agree, if you don't help, if you don't support, if you don't cheer, then you don't love me. This is crazy to me because there's things that every single person in this room that we are thankful for and that we love um, that we will not tolerate. We just won't tolerate. Is it okay with you if someone just smokes a cigarette in a hospital? Why not? What would you say? We're not going to tolerate that. Can't be... Lighten up right in the middle of the surgical center. <laughs> People would go crazy. We're not going to tolerate that. It, 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 are you okay if a, a sex offender becomes a PE teacher at your kid's school? Well, no, why not? Truth is relative. I think that's okay. Oh, but there's going to be a whole other group of people that are going to be like, what? Heck, I'm not going to tolerate that. I'm not going to tolerate that. Parents, you love your kids. I love my kids. Guess what? There are things that my kids do that I'm not going to tolerate. Are y'all here? All the parents of that, I'm just not going to tolerate it. I go in and see Lucy wake her up for school. Hey, baby, it's time to get up. For school, you know, you got to get, oh, Dad, I just want to sleep in all day. Okay, I'm sorry. You just go ahead, baby. You just go ahead and, <laughs> go ahead and lay that head back down. I'll come down in 30 minutes and, you know, bring you some warm milk. Okay, I'm just. <laughs> Shh, y'all don't know my house. Lucy, it's time to get up from school. Oh, Dad, oh, I will get you again. <laughs> get in there and brush your teeth. Ooh. We should try. <laughs> My point is there are things that you love that you're not going to tolerate. Yeah. This is funny. But so what it means is, okay, so you, you, you believe in intolerance, just not when it applies to you. You believe in intolerance, but only when it doesn't apply to you. You want everybody else. We're going to be taught to everybody. But when it comes to me, no, 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 no. And again, this whole entire being forced tolerance, no matter what you believe, no matter what you do, you support, you celebrate. If you don't, you don't love me. Can I just, I want to help us, some of us be set free from whatever you're struggling with today, wherever you are on the list. Listen to me. I love you. You will never change what you're willing to tolerate. You will never change what you're willing to tolerate. Well, I can tell you that because tolerance is actually the great neutralizer of repentance. It's a neutralizer. I don't need to change. I don't need to surrender this area of my life to Jesus. Why? Because I'm right. 
and I feel like this. And God made me this way. And that used to be true back then, but it's not true today because we're smarter and we have a little bit more information than we did back And again, you just begin to feel and begin to tell, I don't need to change. In the name again of tolerance. Truth is, can I tell you something? That God is love. And this is why you need to know that. Because love does something for you that tolerance never can. Oh man, this is so good. Somebody needs to this. Love will do something that tolerance never can. Love causes you because of the love that you feel. Love demands. It, the Bible says that love compels us. For Christ, love compels us. It, force, it pushes us from where we are now. No, I love you. I love you. I love you. You can do this. My spirit's with you. I know you messed up before in the past, but my grace is sufficient. My mercies are new every single morning. Don't stay where you are. You've got to move. You've got to grow. You've got to stretch. Why? Because that's how much I love you. Not because I'm tolerant, but because I love. Because that's how much God, listen, from heaven loves us. He doesn't tolerate us. He loves us. And it's that love, listen, that demands a response that I move from my pain. I move from my struggle. I move from my addiction. I move from my mental thoughts. I move from my pornography addiction. I move from my addiction to alcohol. I move to my sexual temptation. I move because you love. And tolerance will never do that for you. Line number three, if God is loving, he also must be tolerant. The truth, go to the truth, please. The truth is that God loves you too much to tolerate it. God loves you too much to tolerate it. What is it? You ready for this? Someone hear this? We all have an it. I'm the pastor of this church. I was in my office. I was like, oh, I've got an it. You have an it. This is for every single person. Whatever your it is, you need to hear me. Look at me. We're done. If you're here in the room and you have an it, and we all do, whatever it is, look at my eyes. Welcome home. Welcome to a place that's full of, of broken, imperfect people who all have an it, who all have a sin, and who all are in need of God's forgiveness, grace, and mercy. You are not alone. You are not by yourself. You are not marginalized. You are not distant. Welcome. Welcome. Let me read this verse. Romans 2, chapter 3, verse 4. Do you suppose, O man, that you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? It continues, or, or do you presume, that means are you, do you think you can just keep taking advantage of the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and his patience, not knowing that God's kindness actually exists to lead you to what? Can you hear the irony? It's not God loves you, so he'll just let you do what he wants. No, it's God's love and God's kindness and God's mercy that compels you to change. It causes me to want to give up my sexual sin. It causes me to want to give up my way, my feelings, my thoughts. That's why he's kind. That's why he's patient. It's also because he loves why he can't tolerate it. I love this in closing that God's solution to what he could never tolerate. Oh, this is so good. Somebody hear the word of the Lord this morning. God's solution to what he could never tolerate. God's solution to our sin. God's solution to our collective it. 
was his son Jesus. His one and only son, Jesus Christ. And whether you're here and you believe it or not, whether you're struggling or not, we're all on the list somewhere. And you need to know that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is really that the wrath of God, that wrath that we talked about on sinful humanity was completely satisfied on the cross of Jesus Christ. And anyone that's in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come and listen it's here it's ready it's available for you today last verse I'm done y'all okay we're done I'm sorry here we go first John 4 9 through 11 I'm gonna pray this is how God showed his love among us not by tolerating it hey humans y'all just do what you want to he sent, he was active, he sent his one and only son into the world. Here's the reason what? That we might live. That we might live from the sin that's trying to destroy us. Through him, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. Oh, here it is, the gospel. As what? An atoning sacrifice for our sins. It means it was 100% complete. It was 100% satisfied on the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, since God so loved us, isn't it time that we love one another like that? To the people that look like you, that don't look like you, to the people that believe and don't believe, to the people that are struggling, to the people who are wondering, to the people that are hurting, what is our response? To love just like Christ loved us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes right now? Just, we're going to pray.